joining me, everybody. I know this is probably the last session of the day. Um, uh, my name is Veda, and I'm going to be talking about this really interesting topic, at least to me, um, today. I am an AIML solutions architect. Uh, I've been with doing AIML for the past two years, two and a half years now. I am also an ex-serverless solutions architect. Um, so I used to be in the same team as my colleagues here. Um, and I have two, two kids who keep me on my toes all the time. I am also learning violin right now um, because I wanted to lead by example for my son who is also learning violin. So I thought, you know, I should do it too if I ask my son to do it. And um, then I'm just a serverless and AIML enthusiast. I love building machine learning applications and I love using serverless to build those machine learning applications. All right, uh, so that's about me. So before I, I start uh, talking about AI and the different kinds of AI and all of that, quick show of hands. Um, how many of you have used a large language model for personal use? Okay, it's a good number. How many of you are building applications using a large language model or a image-based model? Awesome, cool, thank you. All right, um, so before I get into the, the serverless aspects of um, uh, building applications, um, let's talk about the phases of AI itself, right? So whenever you wanna build a machine learning model, these are the three phases that generally you go through. Uh, the first is the design phase. So data scientists in the design phase pick up large amounts of you know, data, label them, um, do feature engineering on them, do data engineering and feature en engineering on them, figure out which data is useful um, and do tra data transformations on them and all of that. And then also figure out what kind of machine learning algorithm works best for the task at hand. What, what, what does the machine learning algorithm really predict? What should it predict and what kind of algorithms work best? And design those algorithms as well. If neural networks should be used here or regression algorithms or classification algorithms should be used, what kind of algorithms, right? So all of that is done in the design phase. And then comes the training phase, wherein they take the um, data, feature engineered data, and then use the algorithm to train the machine learning model. And this is an intensive process depending on the size of the data and the size of the algorithm itself. Can span multiple CPUs, multiple GPUs, you have to do distributed training and all of that. And then comes the evaluation phase, which I've not really mentioned here, but it's really you know the design and the training and the evaluation is sort of like a loop. Right? You train the model, you evaluate the model on a test data set, and then <clears throat> if you know, figure out if the model has good accuracy for the test data set, if not, go back to design phase and get, maybe get more data or you know, do different kinds of data transformation or maybe use a different algorithm. Right? So it's sort of like a loop. And then once your, your, the data scientist figures out, okay, this is the best model or the algorithm for my task at hand, then comes the inference phase, right? Um, an inference phase is where just you're using that model to um, predict for unseen data, like the production data. Um, you predict what, what happens, so the, make the prediction to the unseen with the unseen data. But for most of us, this inference is what matters as an application developer. You know, the, the model building and the model training, all of that does not matter. The inference is what matters to us as application developers and consumers, right? And we, most of us will use that inference API to just call the API, the model is a black box, and we get the response or the prediction from the API. And, <clears throat> and this is just an endpoint for us. For 99% for of us, it's just an endpoint. As I said, we just call the API and we get the predictions back. All right, but how effectively you use this endpoint comes down to two things. And um, my colleague Eric and I were talking about this and we both came up with this, that you know, 
how effective you are in using these endpoints comes down to data orchestration and choreography um, of that production data and then doing prompt engineering if you're doing uh, generative AI. So I'm gonna talk about both of these things. Um, first, let's talk about why prompt engineering. <clears throat> and if you've used the large language model, you probably know this, right? So I went to this uh, model within uh, Amazon Bedrock, which is our uh, new service, which is also a serverless service um, for accessing these foundation models or large language models through APIs. And why prompt engineering is important. So, um, so, with, so to these models, you ask questions or you ask natural language questions uh, and then it gives you answers, right? So I just went and asked this uh, model uh, within Bedrock and I asked, what, what are black holes, right? And it, it gave me a very nice descriptive answer. And this is, this is okay for me, right? Uh, if I'm developing an application which is just answering you know, uh, taking users' questions and giving me answers to the, giving the answers back to the users, then this is totally fine. But what if I'm developing this application to a bunch of astrophysicists, right? And, and they ask these questions, like an internal application for, for a company which is um, a research company based on physics and um, astronomy. And, and if they ask such questions, these, these kind of answers are Probably not enough, right? So now, I went and asked, it, asked the same question in a different way. You are an experienced astrophysicist. Now tell me what black holes are, right? So I asked the large language model to act like it's an astrophysicist, an experienced astrophysicist, and then tell me what black holes are and look at the detail that it gave me, right? So that's why prompt engineering is so important uh, when you're developing uh, generative AI applications trying out different prompts uh, to see which, give, which prompt gives you the best answer and having a prompt catalog probably even while you develop your applications um, is a good practice. Right? So that's why you know, uh, prompt engineering is so important. Right, um, <clears throat> next let's look at um, how we choose the right kind of AI when you're, as an application developer, you're developing um, applications, Gen AI, or AI applications. So uh, broadly, I mean, currently today, I classify the AI models into two categories for, for our practical purposes, right? The first is the deterministic kind of AI models. And these are the, the traditional models, right, which was, you know, where data scientists took data sets, labeled those data sets, and trained a machine learning model specifically for a particular task in mind. Say for example, you wanted the machine learning model to classify documents. And so data, data scientists would take labeled documents and provide the labels to the model and the model would learn, okay, this kind of document means this is the label and then now it's able to train on that labeled data set and then be and then can predict, okay, this is this kind of document, right? So that was the deterministic nature. That wherein, when you, ask the, when you ask the model a question, every time you ask the question, it gives you the same answer. So it's very, very predictable, right? There's the new kind of AI model, which is more probabilistic. So stochastic, if you wanna be nerdy. Um, stochastic means probabilistic, right? Wherein this new class of models, it's, sorry. Oops. Okay. The new class of models, which is the probabilistic model, every time you ask the question, the answer is very different, right? And there are use cases where you need deterministic models, and there are use cases where you can do with probabilistic model. You probably need a probabilistic or a stochastic model. And there are use cases where you can do these deterministic tasks with the probabilistic model as well, with a large language model as well. So how do you choose, right? So let's see how actually these um, Gen AI models work. <clears throat> so why I say these Gen AI models are prob probabilistic is this, right? So the Gen AI model is trying to always predict 
what the next token is given a sequence of tokens, right? And, and um, a token is a set of letters um, and multiple tokens make up words in the language, right? So if I say, if I give this as a prompt to the Gen AI model, today I went to the, and what the Gen AI model is doing or what the large language model is doing is it scouts through its vocabulary of all tokens and then gives a prob probability score for each token. Um, what, sh uh, what, should be go what token should go next in this, given the sequence of words? And it'll pick, based on some model parameters that you set, um, what the most probable tokens are given the sequence of words. And we call this autoregressive models. That's the autoregressive nature. And that's how we as humans think as well. Given a set of uh, words, we are always trying to, uh, when, we are, when we're speaking, we're always trying to think, okay, what's the next word? What's the next word, right? That's how these um, LLMs are also generating um, text, right? So it does this, you know, it tries to, given these sequence, again, it, so it, it can pick store, today I went to the store, or today I went to the mall, or today I went to the office. Definitely not tomato, because that does not make sense. So it'll have a lower probability score, right? So now after it picks, say, today I went to the store, the next token it probably will pick is two, buy, clothes. So it keeps you know, predicting what the next token is and it does it repeatedly until the whole text is generated or until we ask it to stop. All right, <clears throat> so now let's look at, you know, we looked at probabilistic and deterministic models how can we solve real world problems using AI? So I'm gonna pick this use case, um, which is a very, very common use case across a lot of industries. Transcribe um, uh, audio or video, and then extract the text out of that audio or video, and then summarize it, right? You wanna create summary. Um, some examples of these use cases across the industries are say if you wanna do uh, you have medical transcriptions between um, a doctor and a patient, um, or you have medical reports that you want to extract the text out of it and then summarize it and put it in a database, right? Um, the call center, right? You have conversations between the call center agent and the customer. You want <clears throat> to transcribe it, convert it to text, and summarize the call and maybe take downstream actions on those, right? Um, in the legal, in the financial domains, there are policy documents, financial documents that you wanna summarize and store them off so that the downstream applications can use them. Video transcription as well, right? So across industries, this is a very common use case. And why is this important? Because data, useful information and in data is stored in all of these non-referenceable and non-unsearchable formats. The scanned images, the audio recordings, or the PDF docs, it has a lot of data. And we want to make it searchable and use that in our applications to make business decisions, right? <clears throat> let's see how we can uh, use AI to do this. So let's build an application um, to do that, to, to solve this problem. We wanna get all of that information that's stored in unsearchable format and make it available to our applications. Um, so these are the requirements. Um, we wanna convert the current format, which is audio, uh, into text. And uh, we wanna be able to extract the text and then uh, summarize it and then save it to a database so that it's available um, for other applications. And what are the parameters for this application that I wanna build? We wanna be cost efficient, of course. Uh, we want it to be accurate. Um, the reason I say this because, you know, as you saw, the probabilistic models give me outputs. Every time I ask it to generate something, it gives me a completely different output. So we wanna be accurate. Um, we want to be near real time or daily. As soon as the files are available, we want to kick off the process, right? Um, or at least, you know, do it on a daily basis, on a scheduled basis. All right, so let's see how we can apply AI to this real world problem, 
right? Um, so here are the services that um, I think potentially that could be used to, um, to solve this use case. The first service is Amazon Textract. Uh, Amazon Textract is an API-driven AI service which is able to extract text out of PDF documents, out of scanned images, right? It has deterministic AI models behind the service um, which can extract, it's essentially an OCR technology, optical character recognition technology, which is able to text, extract text out of documents. So that works for me, for PDF documents. The next service is Amazon Transcribe. This is also another AI service which has deterministic models behind the scene, which is um, able to transcribe, convert my audio uh, to text. Give me, take the audio format and then give me text. Right? So that works for my audio files, even video files. Right? The next two services is Amazon Bedrock and Amazon SageMaker. Um, while Amazon Textstack and Transcribe work for me to convert audio uh, to text or extract text from PDF, PDF documents, I need a probabilistic AI service or a probabilistic model which can summarize the text for me in a very succinct manner, right? Um, and I need to use a probabilistic model because it needs to do a, an abstractive summary, not really just extract what is there, it needs to be abstractive. It needs to rephrase. So we need a, the power of generative AI there. Um, so that's why we can either use Bedrock or SageMaker, right? And Amazon Bedrock um, is, um, again, an API-driven serverless service, which, which will give you um, choice of using foundation models, uh, many different foundation models. Um, so, uh, from, many, uh, from many of the startups that we offer, right? And, and SageMaker is another uh, machine learning service which will allow you to train your own machine learning model um, and you know, go all the full cycle of machine learning, right? Design, uh, build, uh, and train the machine learning model and even host the machine learning model, right? If you wanna build your own model, SageMaker is probably the way to go. Build your own model and host the machine learning model there on SageMaker. Or if you want to use a pre-trained model, just use it in, um, in terms of APIs, then Bedrock is a service for you. I'm just going to use this. OK. So <clears throat> just a little note on Amazon Bedrock. Um, what are the benefits? Um, because Bedrock is serverless, and you can really test out several different foundation models using that single API that Bedrock provides. You know, um, it's really easy and, um, to test out all of the foundation models without managing the infrastructure. So the Be uh, Amazon Bedrock service is hosting the large language model, the pre-trained large language model, and you just do inference using the Bedrock APIs. And using the same API, you're able to switch between the foundation models and see which, which works best for your use case because each of these foundation models are trained very differently, used very different data sets for their training, so the, the way they answer the same question is very, very different. And you really need to test out which model works for your use case uh, by issuing those prompts to those foundation models and see which, which model's language is good for your use case, right? Um, so you can choose several foundation models um, from AI21 Labs. We have the Jurassic family of models, Anthropic, um, Claude models, which is very, very popular. Um, we have Stability AI, uh, Stable Diffusion model, if you want to do uh, image, uh, text to image, uh, meaning generate image based on the text prompts that you give. Um, we also have um, the option of choosing Meta's Llama family of models, Llama and Llama 2. Uh, and we also have Amazon's own trained models called the Amazon Titan family of models. And uh, with Amazon Titan, you have the choice of, you know, if you want to just do text to text, there's Titan text. Or if you want to generate embeddings, then we have the Titan embeddings model as well. And with Bedrock, you're able to privately also customize uh, the foundation models, if you want to, say, 
perform fine tuning of the models, then you can do that as well. And of course, while staying safe and secure, your data is never shared with the model providers, your prompts are secure. Uh, we don't take the data and you know, uh, take the data to train the models further, so your data is very secure. <clears throat> All right, let's go back to our application now. So here's the goal of our application. Um, we have the uh, call recordings or the audio, rec audio files or the documents available in an S3 bucket. And we want to generate the summary for those and put it in a database like DynamoDB. All right? All right. So let's see how we can use our AI services to meet the requirements. So I said we want to use Textract and Transcribe, first of all, to extract. So our, our going after our requirements, so the first one was to convert the current format to text, right? And if the current format is an audio file, we can use Amazon Transcribe to first transcribe the audio to text. And then, or if it's a PDF document, then we can send it to Textract and the Textract is able to uh, extract the text from the PDF or image document for us, right? <clears throat> then the next requirement is we want to summarize the text. And as I said, we can use either Bedrock or Amazon SageMaker to do that. And um, how would you choose between Bedrock or SageMaker? Um, that would really depend on if you want to use the foundation model, if you don't want to manage the infrastructure, uh, but just use the pre-trained model through an API, then you would use Bedrock. But if you want to host the model yourself and manage the infrastructure, and figure out you know, um, uh, uh, which, which instance you want to host it on and all of that, then SageMaker is the way to go. Um, also, the choice of models uh, are different. So Bedrock has uh, certain uh, foundation models available, um, but if you want to do like open source models from Hugging Face, then SageMaker has the, um, the Hugging Face ecosystem. Uh, it is integrated with Hugging Face where you can pick foundation models from Hugging Face mostly open source models. And um, the next requirement is save the text to database. Um, we will use DynamoDB table. Again, DynamoDB um, is a NoSQL database and fits into our serverless nature of uh, building the application. All right, um, so let's see if we are um, staying within our parameters here, right? So what was our parameter? We want to be cost efficient. Um, and because we are using all API-driven um, services and serverless services, uh, you're going to be charged only when you use the APIs, right? So um, it's going to be cost efficient for you because you're not paying when you're not using the models. You're only paying when, when you send in the request to the models. And accuracy, right? We want it to be accurate. With the right prompt engineering um, and you know, testing out the several different prompt engineering techniques, we can stay accurate. We can develop an, a very accurate summary of the document with the right prompt engineering techniques. And so Bedrock is going to help us do that. And <clears throat> the third requirement is we want to stay in near real time, meaning as soon as the documents or the audio files are available, we want to kick off this process um, and have the summary ready in our table, right? Or we want to be able to do it on a daily basis or on a scheduled uh, basis. So how are we gonna meet that? So, and also, you know, how, how are we gonna meet that and also uh, pass this data, uh, data through these services so that the data is orchestrated, right? And how this data is orchestrated determines how fast the data is moving through these services, uh, but still staying cost efficient, right? So that's how, why data orchestration is important, how we orchestrate data to move through these services to stay cost efficient determines how cost effective we are, right? 
So for that, I'm going to use AWS step functions. Um, step functions is, as you all probably know, is our low-code, no-code uh, visual workflow service, which helps me create um, IT automation workflows, machine learning workflows, uh, any kind of workflows that I need for my uh, applications. Right. So with step functions, I create the step function workflow, which gets invoked as soon as the items or the audio files or the PDF documents are loaded into my S3 bucket. I'm going to kick off a step function workflow. And that step function workflow is going to take me through the several different services. And finally, it's going to call the Bedrock API um, to um, give me the summary. And the good thing about step functions workflow is it has direct integration to all of these services, um, to Amazon Textract and Amazon Transcribed and to Amazon SageMaker and to DynamoDB. So you don't have to write a lot of code to make this happen. Right? You just design the workflow and use these direct SDK service integrations, and uh, you have a workflow ready. Where you don't have direct service integration, for example, for Bedrock, you can use Lambda function for that compute to make that call to um, the service. You can also use Lambda functions if you want to do some small data transformation between these services as the data goes through these services. And again, Lambda is serverless event-driven compute, so it's, it fits into our criteria of being cost-effective. All right, so here's the full on-demand application. Um, so I don't know if you can see it well. So we start with, um, you know, your first, you start with, uh, you know, as soon as the uh, file is loaded into the S3 bucket, um, you determine the file type, if it's an audio or an image or a PDF document, right? And if it's an audio file, um, we, we take uh, the, the first path wherein we convert the audio to text using transcribe, and then we summarize the audio text using either SageMaker or Amazon Bedrock, and then we save the audio summary to DynamoDB table, right? But if it's a um, text-based file or if it's an image of a uh, document, um, then we can convert the image to text using Amazon um, Textract. We extract the text out of it, and we transform the image text. The text track gives you output in terms of you know, key value pairs and JSON, and so we need to collate all of that text together so that we can feed it to the large language model to summarize it, right? So we can feed the entire document um, to the large language model and, and construct the prompts within our Lambda function um, to say, okay, go and summarize this whole entire body of text for me, right? Um, and then the large language model gives us the summary back, and then we're going to save that into the database. All right. Um, so cost optimization. Let's see um, how, if we are well optimized in terms of cost with this application. Um, and see what we can do. So let's count the cost first. Because we're using Amazon Textract, uh, Transcribe, Step Functions, Lambda, and Bedrock, all of these are API-driven services. As I said, um, these you are charged only when you use the services, right? So these are all on-demand charges. Um, and you're not paying for any idle time. But if you're using SageMaker, um, let's see how the cost uh, spans out. So to host a model within SageMaker, um, say the large language model, um, you need a GPU instance. Say I pick MLG5 2x large instance. The hourly cost to run that uh, model on one instance is $1.51. You run that instance, if you take the daily cost, it's $36, and the monthly cost turns out to be $1,000, and the yearly is so much. It's purely not serverless, right? And if your traffic, depending on your traffic pattern, if your traffic pattern to make inferences, or if you want to generate the summaries maybe daily, right, on a scheduled basis, 
there's no reason you want to run this um, G5 instance, which is a GPU instance, all the time, 24/7, right? You just you're just um, it's not cost efficient at all for you, right? Or even if you have like a um, you know if you want to do near real time, and if your traffic is unpredictable, um, and if your traffic is bursty, I wouldn't want to keep my GPU instance running up and all the time, 24/7, right? So let's see how we can make this SageMaker endpoint on demand. Let's make this serverless. Can we do it? Yes, we can. So what I'm going to do is take the current existing step function workflow that I built, and also because the step function workflow can integrate directly with SageMaker, I'm going to have an additional step where I create the SageMaker endpoint Right, and bring it up first, insert my current workflow there, and then once the summary is generated, I'm going to shut it down right? using the same step function workflow. Now, wrapping up this entire application, so this is how it's, um, it looks. So I'm going to first create the SageMaker endpoint configuration, um, and then then create the endpoint itself, and then wait for the endpoint to come up, right? Um, so I'm going to have a loop there, so and keep checking if the endpoint came up, and then once the endpoint is in service, then I'm going to take this workflow, the entire workflow, and run it, right? And then I'm going to then shut down the endpoint and delete the endpoint. This is extremely cost efficient now. Uh, especially when you have a scheduled um, run, right? So let's see the cost now. Okay, so here's the full scheduled application, right, in the step functions workflow. And um, I can also use a distributed step function distributed map now to process all of the files in parallel. Well, in, in my previous workflow, I, had, I used to invoke this for every file that was um, ingested. But now I can take the distributed map functionality with, uh, within, Sage, uh, within step functions and then run it in parallel for all of the, run the same set of processes, which is uh, extract the text from the image, transform it, summarize it, and store it in the database for all of the files that were dropped in my S3 bucket in parallel and then shut down the endpoint. So now let's count the cost of SageMaker on demand, right? So now because I am creating the endpoint and shutting down on demand, my monthly cost for assuming low traffic, fairly low traffic, is reduced from $1,000 to $45, right? So um, with the with SageMaker uh, with Step Functions, I'm able to convert my um, SageMaker endpoint to an on-demand serverless endpoint, and that's like 93, 96 percent yearly savings for me. All right, so here are the results, right? Um, so we we actually created this application and um, ran a surgical pathology report um, and um, you know, extracted the text using Textract and then took all of the extracted text and um, sent it to um, a large language model which was hosted in SageMaker. And that was the summary um, which it uh, gave us. Right? And this is the summary that I'm going to be storing in the database and use it for my downstream um, applications. So, um, what are the key takeaways from this? Oops, sorry. So, for most of us, AI is just as simple as an endpoint. Um, unless you're a data scientist, you're not going to be training models, and more so in the in the space of generative AI. We are going to be using pre-trained models. It is an endpoint. The way we develop applications will change, will differ, because we are now looking at how to do prompt engineering, 
how to test those prompts, um, and, and all of those things. And um, use the best model for the job. There are plenty of AI models out there. Um, choosing if you want to do a generative, if you want to use a generative AI model or a uh, predictive model is important for the use case. And also in, in this space, there are lots of models out there, lots of uh, options for you. Figure out, choose, you have to test and figure out which model works best for this use case at hand, um, and then choose that model, right? Um, and optimize the cost through model availability. Uh, some of these models, again, you know, the, the model that you choose might be available within Bedrock or within SageMaker, or you have to host the model. So optimize that cost. You know, if you're using a SageMaker-based model, then as I said, you can use step functions to make it more cost optimal for you. Um, it, it's the cost going to be even more when you, you know, scale it out, right? Say, for example, you have lots of files dropping into those S3 buckets. Now you need more instances of that large language model to be available, the costs are gonna significantly add up. So optimizing um, those costs is also important, right? And finally, use managed services like step functions and Lambda and Bedrock and EventBridge to orchestrate your data to and from this model endpoint so that you're being cost effective, uh, you're not paying for idle time, um, and you are more agile in building your applications. This, these are like low-code, no-code solutions. So um, you can quick build applications quickly and iterate on building those applications really quickly. All right, and uh, with that, here's more information if you wanna um, get information about patterns and um, several different serverless patterns, the serverlessland.com is um, a good place to start. And thank you.